The aim of this video is to look at the key duties performed by a boundary umpire in Australian football. The number one aim is to determine if the ball has crossed the boundary line. And there's two possibilities. That's where the ball has gone out of bounds on the full or it's just gone out of bounds. In which case, the boundary umpire must throw the ball back into the field of play. In some situations near the goals, boundary umpires need to assist goal umpires in their decision making. After a goal, the ball is returned back to the field umpire and it's the boundary umpire's duty to perform that. Also, the boundary umpire must assist in monitoring the player positions at the start of play or the restart after a goal. And one thing we won't be looking at in this video is the situation where a boundary umpire may need to report a player for any reportable offences. Prior to performing these duties, let's have a look at the basic appearance and tools that are required to go onto the field as a boundary umpire. Most leagues and associations will have a basic expectation for uniform, and that is shirt, shorts, socks, and sweatbands. The shoe type or colour may vary, so that's probably something you'll need to check in your individual league. But also as well, we can note some other accessories that the boundary umpire must have. We can see in the umpire's left hand that we've got a whistle. In their right socks, there's a pen, which along with a notebook and a pocket will be used should a reportable offence occur. Prior to the start of play, the umpires will go onto the field as a group led by the field umpires and a warm-up will occur on the field. After some practicing of some throw-ins, the field umpires will instruct the boundary umpires to break to their positions. In this video, we'll have a look at the positions based on 18 players on the field and we'll be looking at a two boundary umpire system. In this diagram, the red oval representing the ball is where play will commence, right at the centre of the ground. And the two green stars that we can see are the starting positions for the boundary umpires. The umpires are located in those positions so they can see down one wing of the square and they can see across to the top of the 50 metre arc. It's the job of all umpires at this time to make sure the players are in their correct starting positions and the boundary umpires can assist the field umpires by talking to them if that's not the case. So we're looking for each team to have six players within the 50 metre arcs and they're indicated by the blue dots or the orange dots, that's two different teams. And there are six players between the 50 metre arcs, that's four in the square and two, one on each side of the square which are on the wings. Boundary umpires can inform field umpires of any discrepancies in the position by voice or by using their whistle. Once the game starts, both boundary umpires break from their positions and they run at a diagonal so that they line up with where the play is at that time. In the coming section of the video, we'll have a look at how boundary umpires position themselves throughout the game. Most of the time, the ball will be moving up and down the centre corridor of the ground. And in these instances, what we want to do is make sure that the boundary umpires line themselves up with the play. We can see it here on this section of the video that both umpires are opposite each other and they're trying to run up and down such that they align themselves up with the play at that time. Variations do occur close to goals and also if the ball comes close to the line where the boundary umpire is located. In this example, we can see that the ball's moving close to the boundary line on the left hand side. The boundary umpire in that case is backed off. You want to be about 15 metres away from where the ball's crossing the line at that point because we want to be able to see the ball crossing the line and we also don't want to be in a position where we may have to back off for safety when the players rush towards us. The umpire on the opposite side of the ground has now run in towards the square. Boundary umpires are allowed to run in as far as a centre square, but not over it, so that they can cut down the running when they're running up and down between the opposite ends of the ground. We can see now when the ball's on the opposite side of the ground, the umpire on the right hand side is now backed off down the line so they're about 15 metres away from where the ball will possibly cross the line. And the boundary umpire on the left hand side of the ground is coming as far as the centre square, again so they can cut their running down. So these diagrams are based on general play when the ball's moving up and down the ground. What about when the ball's coming from a set kick, say from a mark or a free kick? In these cases, the boundary umpire needs to move forward to the play because they know which way the play is going and they need to set themselves up. In this diagram, we can see that the ball's been kicked from the back of the square. So the boundary umpires can move down approximately 30 to 40 metres ahead of the play, ready for the next act of play. This, of course, is when the ball's in the centre of the ground. What about if the ball's near one of the lines? 
we can see in this next diagram that what will happen is one boundary umpire, in this case the one on the left, can push in towards the centre square to save themselves running, and the boundary umpire on the right hand side will stay on the boundary line. Sometimes due to quick movement of the ball, the boundary umpires can get caught behind the play. So we can see here that the green star representing the boundary umpire has to push themselves wider so they get a good view of the ball crossing the line. So what makes a ball out of bounds? Well as the ball approaches the line, it may start to cross it, but until the ball's completely across the line, it is still in play. In these situations, particularly when the ball's moving slowly across the line, we need to be patient and make sure the ball's completely crossed, as it has done now, before we can call it out of bounds. Let's have a look at some situations in gameplay. In this case, we can see the players are contesting the ball very close to the line and the boundary umpire is standing approximately 15 metres away observing the play down the line. Now the question is which side of the pack does the boundary umpire stand? After this video we'll have a look at the reasoning behind which side of the pack the umpire stands. The field umpire now will perform a ball up and the players contest that ball and the boundary umpire maintains their position. And slowly the ball will go towards the line and the boundary umpire is ideally placed where they can see right down the line and they make the call that the ball has gone out of bounds and they do that by raising their arm vertically and blowing their whistle. So when play gets close to the line, a boundary umpire has got two choices as to which direction they back away. Now we can see here in the diagram we've got a short side and a long side and that refers to the distance to the goals on that particular side. Now if we stand on the short side, there's a danger that if the ball breaks in the opposite direction, in other words to the longer side, that we may fall two or three kicks behind the play very quickly and we've got a bit of catching up to do. Whereas on the shorter side there's only a small distance towards the goals and that means we may only have to catch up one kick. Now things do change when we're close to goals and we'll have a look at that later on in this video. Let's have a look at some more examples of boundary umpire positioning when play gets close to the line. In this first example the players are approaching the line and the boundary umpire is having to back away quickly down the line. And they do this so they can maintain their view of the boundary line and then make their decision. In this next example, the boundary umpire has gone on a slight tangent away from the line, but they've done this to ensure they get the best view of the ball crossing the line at that particular point. In this example and the previous one, the umpires are ensuring they've got the best view. Have a look at this umpire here, he's running backwards to ensure he maintains observation of the ball and then as the ball is kicked he turns his body so he's following the path of the ball. In this next diagram we see what occurs if a boundary umpire does not move down the line as the play gets close to them. If they back away that means they lose sight of the line and it's possible they may make the incorrect decision about whether the ball's out of bounds or not. Sometimes if the ball moves fast in a game of Australian football, we may find that the boundary umpire falls behind the play. If that occurs, we need to be aware that the goal umpire is there to assist us. So if we do fall behind the play, look carefully at the goal umpire. If they raise their arm vertically, that means the ball is out of bounds. If they raise their arm and place it horizontally, that means the ball's out of bounds on the full. In this next piece of vision, we can see the goal umpire run towards the behind post indicating that the ball is out of bounds and they do this by raising their arm vertically. This enables the boundary umpire to make a decision even if they're behind. Variation in positioning does occur when the ball is near goals. One example of that is a set shot on goal normally within the 50 metre arc. In that case both boundary umpires approach the behind post on their side of the ground and the reason why they do this is to ensure that they assist the goal umpire and also they're in the best position should the ball cross the boundary line near the behind posts. Boundary umpires must show urgency to get to the post if that's what's required and they need to keep in mind that they must be observing the ball at all times. So if that means that they need to turn backwards once they pass the player with a set kick, that's what they need to do to ensure they maintain observation. Within the 50 metre arcs, if neither team has a set kick, then once the ball is within approximately 25 metres of goal, the boundary umpire should aim to get to the behind posts on their side of the ground. If the defensive team has a set kick, then like in previous examples, the boundary umpire should aim to get 30 to 40 metres ahead of the ball 
this time in the direction of the opposite goals. And standing at the posts, boundary umpires want to make sure that they can still see the play downfield and they also must be standing close to the post, approximately within one metre of the post itself. In this example, a player has a set shot on goal. The boundary umpire has run past them and is running towards the post and is doing so backwards so they can maintain observation of the ball at all times. Once the boundary umpires get to the posts, they call out to the goal umpire and they can do that by name to make sure that the goal umpire knows that they're there. It is a chance now for them to catch their breath, but they must be prepared to assist the goal umpire should the ball veer towards either post. And they can assist by calling out yours, which means a goal umpire can make a decision, or mine, which means the boundary umpire is saying it's my decision to make either out of bounds on the full or out of bounds. If a boundary throw-in needs to occur close to goals, one boundary umpire who's taking the throw-in will obviously go to that position, but the boundary umpire on the opposite side needs to go to the post. Now that's quite critical because if there's a snapshot out of the pack after the throw-in, that boundary umpire may be able to assist the goal umpire who may not be in a good position to see the ball go across towards that behind post. It's important to note that once that throw-in occurs, the boundary umpire that does the throw-in must be urgent towards the post so that they're also able to assist the goal umpire should a shot on goal occur. In these two examples, both boundary umpires are very close to the post. So they perform their throw-in and then they turn observe the play and run in towards the post. If a behind occurs and the boundary umpires were at the post after a set shot or just in general play, the boundary umpires turn and run backwards towards the 50 metre arc and station themselves there while the kick out occurs. In some situations, the behind will occur as the boundary umpires are approaching the post. And as we can see here, the goal umpire will tap their chest and that indicates to the boundary umpires you don't need to come all the way into the post, I'm about to make a decision. The boundary umpires can then run into or run back to the 50 metre arc and station themselves there waiting for the kick out to occur. After a goal has occurred, the boundary umpires must now work together to get the ball back to the centre of the ground where a field umpire awaits them for the restart of play. The process to do this is quite simple. One boundary umpire will collect the ball after a goal has occurred and another one will deliver it to the field umpire in the centre of the ground. At some stage partway in between that journey, the ball must be passed from the first boundary umpire to the second. Before we go through this example, let's have a look at a few key points on the ground. The field umpires are waiting in the centre of the ground. We can see them near the circle. And the two corners of the square close to goals are called the short corners and the opposite corners to them on the other side of the square are called the long corners. Using the terms short corner and long corner will help us describe the directions where the boundary umpires are going to run. So let's assume the boundary umpires have communicated to each other. The boundary umpire on the right post is going to collect the ball, while the boundary umpire on the left post is going to run the ball through the middle to the field umpire. The boundary umpire on the left will station themselves approximately 10 metres out from the goal square whilst they're waiting for the ball to come to them. So we'll notice first of all the field umpire has changed position in the centre of the ground waiting for the ball to come to that side. And the first boundary umpire with the ball is now running the ball through and the ball swapped about a metre to two metres apart like a relay run so it's doing this at pace. The first umpire will approach near the short corner. The ball is passed in the middle of the ground and the boundary umpire who's passed the ball will run past the long corner. Both boundary umpires are now in a position as they were at the beginning of the game so they can observe the players in their set positions prior to the game restarting. Let's have a look at this process in a game situation. In this example a goal is scored 
and the boundary umpire on the left post indicates to their partner that they are going to run the ball through the middle. Once the goal umpire signals, that boundary umpire now will place their right arm out, indicating to the field umpire they're coming from that side of the ground. In this next example, we can see the two boundary umpires about to swap the ball. There's a few things to note. Ideally, we'd like to run the ball through the middle of the ground, but we also want to avoid player traffic. So you can see in this case, they've gone right of the group of players. They pass the ball approximately two metres apart and they do so in a relay motion. So that means the umpire that was waiting at the top of the goal square starts to begin their run as the other umpire approaches. And when the ball's handed over, both of them are running at the same speed. The umpire who passed the ball off will now approach towards the short corner while the other umpire carries through to the field umpire. Let's have a look at that same process in normal speed. Here's another example of a handover after a goal, and the boundary umpire on the left, who handed the ball over, is now running towards the short corner and setting themselves up for the restart of play. In these next two examples, we can see the ball being passed to the field umpire, who's deliberately set themselves up into the path of the boundary umpire. And we can also see here that the boundary umpire is running past the long corner, turning backwards and setting themselves up for the restart of play. When the ball goes out of bounds, a field umpire will instruct the boundary umpire to throw the ball back in. And the process is pretty simple. Every time a boundary umpire throws the ball in, they throw the ball towards the centre of the ground. And you can see in all the different locations here on the ground where that direction may be. Now there is an exception to this. And when the ball's near the behind post, the boundary umpire needs to be mindful that they want to throw the ball in so it avoids going into the centre corridor of the ground. So in that situation, you just want to line yourself up so it's just a little bit straighter. The reason why that is, is we want to avoid throwing the ball into the path in front of goals, just in case it creates an easy snapshot for the players attacking the goal. So just a reminder, when the ball's near the behind post, just line yourself up so you're throwing straighter as opposed to directly towards the centre area in front of goals. Let's have a look at some outcomes and what the boundary umpire does in each case in a game situation. If the ball completely crosses the line and it has made contact with the ground, it's deemed to be out of bounds. And the umpire signals this by raising one arm vertically and blowing their whistle at the same time. When a football is kicked and it completely crosses the line without having made contact with the ground or without having been touched, it's deemed to be out on the full. Just for clarity, a kick is when it comes off the lower part of the leg of a player, which is below the knee of the player. The boundary umpire signals out on the full by bringing both hands towards their mouth, blowing the whistle firmly, and then placing both arms out in a horizontal manner. If a boundary umpire is approximately 15 metres away or less from the location where the ball crossed the line to be out on the full, they can assist the field umpire by running to that spot and indicating the location where the ball crossed the line by placing one arm towards that spot. That allows the field umpire to place the mark for the opposing team. If the ball has been kicked and it completely crosses the line without having made contact with the ground, but has been touched in transit, which includes being punched over the line, then the boundary umpire needs to signal this in two steps. The first thing to do is to indicate out of bounds as you would do normally by raising your arm vertically and blowing a whistle. The next thing to do is to take the hand with the whistle and tap that on the back of the other hand still raised vertically three times to indicate that the ball has been touched. Sometimes a ball may appear to be out on the full but it's come off the upper part of a leg of a player. In that case, what we need to do is blow out of bounds as we would do normally by raising one arm vertically and blowing our whistle. And the next thing we need to do is tap the upper part of our leg three times to indicate that it's come off above the knee of the player. Now there is an instance which may appear to be a contradiction to the things that we've just stated. And that is what occurs in a ruck contest. If two players are going up for a ruck contest, either from a boundary throw in or a ball up, which occurs in the field of play, if one of the rucks is to tap or punch the ball directly over the line, 
on the full without it being touched or without it having touched the ground, it's deemed to be out on the full. And the boundary umpire must be awake to this and indicate as if it was out on the full. Let's have a look at some of the things that may occur near the goal area. Now in a situation where the ball hits the post, but has made contact with the ground prior to doing so, this is deemed to be out of bounds. What we need to do is stand aside from the post so we can be clearly seen by spectators and the field umpire, and we blow out of bounds as we would do normally. But what we then do is tap the post three times. If the goal umpire has already done that for us prior to us getting to the post, it's sufficient just to blow out of bounds. If the ball is kicked and hits the behind post on the full without having touched the ground or being touched in transit, it's deemed to be out on the full. As before, if we're at the post, what we do is we stand aside, signal out on the full, and then tap the post three times. If the goal umpire has already done this for us, signaling out on the full is sufficient. If the ball has been kicked and hits the behind post on the full, but has been touched in transit, it's deemed to be out of bounds. So we signal out of bounds as we would do normally. And then what we do is we indicate that the ball has been touched. And then we also indicate that the ball has hit the behind post. Thanks very much for watching. If you have any further questions about boundary umpiring, please place them in the comments below. And also subscribe to our channel so you can see other aspects of Australian football.